of the explanation. In fact, if you think about it, so requiring would immediately generate an infinite regress of explanations of explanations of explanations so that nothing would ever be explained. So, for example, if astronauts were to discover a pile of machinery on the back side of the moon, they would be justified in inferring that this is best explained as the results of intelligent agents who left it there, even if they had no idea whatsoever who these intelligent agents were or how they came to be there. In order to recognize an explanation as the best, you don't have to have an explanation of the explanation. In the same way, the design hypothesis being the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe doesn't depend on our being able to explain the designer. That can be left an open question for future inquiry. Moreover, the complexity of a mind is not really analogous to the complexity of the universe. A mind's ideas may be complex, but a mind itself is a remarkably simple thing, being an immaterial entity not composed of pieces or separable parts. Moreover, properties like intelligence, uh, self-consciousness, and volition are not contingent properties which a mind might lack, but are essential to its nature. Thus, postulating an uncreated mind behind the cosmos is not at all like uh, postulating an undesigned cosmos with all of its contingent and variegated quantities and constants. So that postulating a mind behind the cosmos most definitely does represent an advance in simplicity for whatever that might be worth. Number four, objective moral values in the world. If naturalism is true, then I think it's plausible that objective moral values do not exist. Now, to say that there are objective moral values is to say that something is right or wrong independently of whether anybody believes it to be so. It's to say, for example, that Nazi anti-Semitism was morally wrong even though the Nazis who carried out the Holocaust thought that it was right. And it would still be wrong even if the Nazis had won World War II and succeeded in brainwashing or exterminating everybody who disagreed with them so that everybody thought the Holocaust was right. And the claim here is that in the absence of God, moral values do not seem to be objective in that sense. So, premise one of the argument is, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Many theists and atheists alike concur on this point. For example, the late J.L. Mackey of Oxford University, one of the most influential atheists of our day, admitted, and I quote, if there are objective values, they make the existence of a god more probable than it would have been without them. Thus, we have a defensible argument from morality to the existence of a god. But instead of inferring god's existence, Mackey therefore denied that objective moral values exist. He wrote, it is easy to explain this moral sense as a natural product of biological and social evolution. Michael Roos, uh, an eminent philosopher of science, agrees. He explains, and I quote, morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such references truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Friedrich Nietzsche, the great 19th century atheist who proclaimed the death of God, understood that the death of God meant the destruction of all meaning and value in life. I think that Friedrich Nietzsche was right. But we've got to be very careful here. 
The question here is not, must we believe in God in order to live moral lives? I'm not claiming that we must. Nor is the question, can we recognize objective moral values without believing in God? I certainly think that we can. Rather, the question here is, if God does not exist, do objective moral values exist? And like Mackey and Roos, I just don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the morality evolved by homo sapiens on this planet is objective. After all, given a naturalistic worldview, what's so special about human beings? They're just accidental byproducts of nature which have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust called the planet Earth, lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe and which are doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. On the naturalistic view, some action, say rape, may not be socially advantageous among human beings and so has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the naturalistic worldview, there's nothing really wrong with raping someone. Thus, without God, there is no absolute right and wrong which imposes itself on our conscience. But the problem is that as premise two states, objective moral values do exist. And deep down, I think we all know it. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of objectively existing moral values and duties which impose themselves upon us. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of the moral realm than the objective reality of the physical world. The reasoning of Professor Roos at best proves that our subjective perception of objective moral values has slowly evolved. But if moral values are gradually discovered rather than invented, then our gradual and fallible perception of moral realm, the moral realm no more undermines the objective reality of that realm than our gradual, fallible perception of the physical world undermines the objectivity of that realm. Most of us recognize that in moral experience, we do apprehend a realm of objective values. Roos himself confesses in another place, and I quote, the man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Actions like rape, torture, and child abuse aren't just uh, socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Similarly, love, tolerance, self-sacrifice are really good. But if objective values cannot exist without God, and objective values do exist, then it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. Number five, the possibility of God's existence. I rarely share this argument in a public talk, uh, not because I think it's unsound, but because it's so abstract that students are apt to think that uh, either it's some sort of a trick or they just don't understand it. But tonight I'm going to take a risk and share it with you. Now, in order to understand this argument, you need to understand what philosophers mean by possible worlds. A possible world is just a way the world might have been. It's a complete description of reality. 